One of the biggest contributions from India to the world has been the discovery of zero. Imagine a world without zero. Computers will not be able to work. Financial markets will collapse. Imagine if India had taken a patent on it, what would have been the situation? <laughs> we are standing at a very fine exhibition called the South Asia's Contributions to Mathematics at the India International Center. And I have with me Professor Manjul Bhargav, one of the world's foremost mathematicians, a field medal winner, equivalent to a Nobel Prize. And we start off with one of the finest manuscripts which shows India's contribution, the Bakshali manuscript. Professor Manjul, what does this manuscript say and what are these numbers here? Yeah, as you said, yeah, this is a very beautiful exhibition about ancient Indian manuscripts and India's contributions to mathematics. This is the famous, this is a, a, a portion of a famous Bakshali manuscript, uh, which was written in around the year 300. Uh, it uh, has wh wh where number. are the zeros in this? Yeah, so this is the first place where we see the way numerals were written just as they are written today, just with slightly different shapes. And shunya used to be written as a shunya bindu. So we have these various dots here, which signify zeros. Uh, the, they used to be used as placeholders. They weren't considered full numbers like they are today. But this is exactly the way we write numbers today, except they wrote zeros as little dots. And then some, about 300 years later, Brahmagupta said, well, actually, these dashunya bindus should actually be numbers, just like any other numbers. And so he gave rules for zero plus any number is that number, zero times any number is zero. He gave the rules that said that zero is a number just like any other. And then over time, these shunya bindus became circles that are just as big as any other number to signify their rightful place alongside so, their fellow so, numbers. So, so the numerals 1, 2, 9 and 0 came from India? They came let's, from India. Let's look at the other parts of the yeah, exhibition. Yeah, they came from India. And, and, and we, we, we kind have of amazing, a great tradition. Yeah, it's amazing that any number, however large, can be written just using 10 symbols, 1 through 9 and 0. That idea originated in India because previously, for example, in Europe, they used Roman numerals where each time you had a larger number you needed to write, you needed to introduce more symbols. But in the Indian system, you only have to write uh, 10 symbols to write any number. And that, was a, that changed the world. And what do we see here? Yeah, one of the reasons that Indians were able to come up with this, uh, this system of writing really large numbers using only 10 symbols is that they actually had a fascination with very, very large numbers. And if they had to make a new symbol for any time they had a larger number, they would run out of symbols. So it was kind of forced on them that they need a way to write really large numbers. So already in the Yajurved, you see that they, they were talking about huge numbers, prayutta, meaning million. Right? It and also they, means yeah. billion. <laughs> they billion. No, no, hundred trillion. billion. Paradha meant trillion. So in other parts of the world, nobody was talking about such numbers way back you know, thousands of years ago as they were in the Yajurved. So and we were also Yajurved, talking of negative numbers? Uh, negative numbers were already being talked about in the Bakshali manuscript, as we saw earlier. And then Brahmagupta, again, codified the notion of negative number, that it should be a number just like a positive number or zero. It's just as important as every other number. And so zero and negative numbers were already in the public discourse, in the discourse of ancient literature, and then Brahmagupta put them on a solid mathematical foundation. These are all numbers that are important. They should be called numbers, they should be added, subtracted, and multiplied, just like we, other cultures used to just do with positive numbers. Brahmagupta said, no, all numbers are numbers, they're equal, and they should be called numbers, negative numbers, zero, positive numbers are all numbers. And, and what do we see here? Is this the Pythagoras theorem from India? Yeah, this is uh, another example of, uh, of a contribution of India that's often not uh, known or talked about in school. The Pythagorean theorem was actually written about in the world's oldest geometry texts, the Shulva Sutras. And the first Shulva Sutra was written by a mathematician and geometer named Bodhayana. And Bodhayana's work goes back to around the year uh, 700, and 700 BC. Uh, and it contains the first statement of, of what we now call the Pythagorean theorem, which should perhaps be called the Bodhayan theorem or the Bodhayan Pythagoras theorem that the rope corresponding to the diagonal of a rectangle produces whatever is made by the lateral and the vertical sides individually. That's essentially a modern statement 
of the Badhayana Pythagoras theorem. And, and that is the actual and that's the actual that's the actual sloka of which this is a, the translation, and it's just the modern statement of the Badhayana Pythagoras theorem, which is kind of remarkable, 700 BC. And we have forgotten it in India. We have forgotten it in India. It hasn't been taught. Don't you feel sad but, about that? Yeah, it is sad because it's uh, important to know the correct history. It's also inspiring that uh, uh, such important theorems were discovered in the context of something that's very artistic. These were used to make artistic uh, Vedic altars. Uh, it, was a, it was essentially an art in which beautiful theorems were being discovered. That connection between mathematics and art that was very strong in India is something that's now been forgotten, but should be brought back. And the decimal system represented here? Yeah, the decimal is, system. You can't imagine a numbering system today in the modern world without the decimal. Yeah, how could we do compute modern day computing or anything in science uh, without the system that we use today? Writing all numbers just using ten symbols. Uh, the first computations uh, were done in the Bakshali manuscript, as we saw, but then real scientific computations, astronomical calculations, were first done by Aryabhata uh, in the year 499 in his Aryabhatiya. He showed how to use the Hindu numerals or the Indian numerals uh, using just those ten symbols to do complex scientific calculations. He first demonstrated that, and now, of course, that changed the world. Now we do all scientific computations in this way that Aryabhata introduced So we have us. a very proud tradition which we somehow seem to be forgetting and right, right. we I mean, need to first, revive? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, this is where our, our whole system of doing science originated using the ten symbols and the Indian number system. And, and what do we see here? Right yeah, then uh, a lot of great mathematical discoveries in India happened uh, because of the way uh, poetry and language uh, developed in India. So the classification of meters into short and long syllables uh, inspired a lot of great mathematics, including the de development of binomial coefficients and combinatorial mathematics, the development of, of what are uh, often called the Fibonacci numbers, were actually uh, written about uh, first by Virahanka, who was inspired by Pingala, as Virahanka himself writes. Uh, he discovered the Virahanka Fibonacci numbers way back in the year 700, inspired was, by the work and of Fibonacci. And it was Fingala. Fibonacci which took the manuscripts to Europe and then they became Arab numerals, which yeah, should Fibonacci, ideally be Hindu numbers. That's right, yeah. Fibonacci uh, was very uh, inspired by the, the Hindu number system, the Indian number system, and he was the one who really popularized them in Europe. He said, these are the numbers. Instead of the Roman numerals, come on, scientists, you should be using these numerals. You'll be able to go so much more. And Fibonacci is the one who really introduced that to Europe. And he called them the Indian numerals. But uh, over time, they started being called the Arabic numerals because the transmission of these numerals was coming from the Arab world. And then, of course, India started calling them the Arab numerals because during colonial times, the uh, Europeans were calling them the Arabic numerals. But and the Arabs called and, them Hindu. And the Fibonacci yeah. numbers we see on a sunflower as they go round and That's round right. and so many different yeah, other... Yeah, the Virahanka Fibonacci numbers are some of the most important numbers in mathematics. There's a whole journal dedicated to them. A whole journal to a that? A whole journal wow. <laughs> called the Fibonacci Quarterly. But it's just such an amazing story that these numbers first originated in the context of classifying meters in terms of long and short syllables way back in 300 BC and then in the year 700, way before Fibonacci. It's a beautiful story connecting mathematics and art that we've forgotten in modern times. Uh, and what do we see on this, uh, 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 these uh, palm leaf manuscripts? Oh, these ones I'm not so familiar with. But these are palm leaf. This is this is ancient. A lot of them is they don't know the period because they are not dated, 1150 CE. So so oh, so, so very old. A lot of oh, these have a lot of algebraic operations on them. Yeah. Yeah, and they're so fine if you look at, and uh, it's a it's a real art to preserve them. Sure. We are u losing a lot of uh, important manuscripts sure. uh, uh, to rot and decay because they have not been preserved so well. And you can see that they contain so much mathematics and science. Uh, one day, I hope India really makes the effort to preserve them, to digitize them, and to make them available to research to, uh, to scientists and to, and to experts uh, in and, Indian and languages. And we have, we have the famous zero again represented here. Tell me a little bit about the story of zero. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> the notion of zero actually first originates in linguistic manuscripts, like, like Pingala's Chandashastra in the third century where he describes a binary system, just using zero and one, he uses them to enumerate all meters having a given number of syllables. And that, that's the origin of zero linguistically. And then, of course, it's Aryabhata and <coughs> Brahmagupta who took that linguistic zero and that philosophical zero and made it something mathematical. 
And that uh, it's really inspiring that it sort of originated in philosophy and in linguistics, the notion of zero, and then gradually made its way into, into mathematics. It actually first made its way into architecture. Uh, and a lot of ancient architecture manuscripts in India talk about how, how a building is defined not by its <coughs> walls, but by the empty spaces made by the walls. The shunya of a building is what's the important part of a building. So philosophy, architecture, linguistics is where zero first came, and then with the works of the Bakshali manuscript and Aryabhatta and Brahmagupta, the concept of zero made its way into mathematics. And of course, that changed the world. The rest is history. But the way mathematics is taught today, students hate them, hate mathematics. How should we correct it? Well, first of all, we should have more of these inspiring stories of the connections between philosophy and architecture and, and poetry and mathematics. We should see a little bit more of that. But secondly, it shouldn't be about uh, learning things by memorization and doing procedures robotically. It should be about discovery, about exploration. That's what when we mathematicians do mathematics, we think of it as, an, as uh, we're adventurers, you know, trying to creatively find new things that have never been known before. Uh, but in, in school, mathematics has been largely a drudgery, and that needs to change. You know, mathematics is a creative, artistic process involving discovery and exploration. Uh, it's a hands-on activity, and hopefully the new school textbooks that are being developed now will, uh, will start to... And you have played a role in that, uh, in the new education policy, along with yeah, the, Dr. K. Kasturi Rangan, right, the legendary yeah. uh, That's right. It was, a, it was such a great pleasure to work with him on the new education policy, and we had this vision together that we must, uh, we must bring this more hands-on learning to science and to all subjects and the interdisciplinarity uh, of uh, the relationship between all subjects should be brought into, in, into the education system. And it should be discovery-based, as we said, and exploration-based. So we tried to bring that all very clearly into the new education policy and we hope that will percolate into the, into the new textbooks and make learning much more engaging and fun. Thanks a lot for speaking to me, Professor Manjul. Thank you, always, Pallavji. Always, Great pleasure. always a pleasure learning so much from you. You make mathematics accessible and you bring back through this exhibition how we have an ancient tradition of mathematics. Thank Thanks you, Pallavji. a lot. Thank you for having me. So that was Professor Manjul Bhargav telling us a little bit of the story of zero. Imagine a world without zero. Computers won't work. Financial markets won't work. Nothing would happen without the digit zero. And all one to nine to zero to calculus, algebra, Pythagoras theorem, all of that emerged in India and we seem to have forgotten about it. Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you. Thank you. At this very fine exhibition at the India International Center on the mathematical traditions of South Asia, in New Delhi, Palav Bagla for NDTV.